Masahisa Fukasi family measured in at 9 inches by just over 12 inches published by MacBooks in September 2019 it, it's 80 pages it has a range of I think 34 plates yep 34 plates it's very similar to the 1991 edition of the family it's modernized a little bit the cover and everything else the plate numbers in the Japanese and English notes on the back are, are roughly the same it's got a hard, it's hard band, it's got a black book grain finish and a bossed red foil on the front of it. Those of you who are familiar with Masahisa's work may know his really seminal book, which was The Ravens, which is really regarded as one of his best works. He's got a few other books where he's concentrated on his wife, Yoko. This book and a really important book which I feel is part of this book, is Memories of Father. To understand this book more, I feel you need to read and look through Memories of Father, because I think they both work in parallel to each other. I'd be really interested to see if Mac are going to publish Memories of Father, because I feel this book needs that book to work properly. Some may disagree, but I really feel that both of them tell the same story but in a different way. They're both about Masahisa's family. This book particularly is focused around his father's studio, which I think was his grandfather's studio, became his brother's studio around the 80s and 90s and he went there and, and produced these pictures. He produced them I think till about 1975 and then he had a bit of time out then he went back in 19. 85 around that period and you you can see halfway through the difference in the, in the technology and the advancement in film and stuff so going back to memories of father masahisa really likes to focus and, and in his work he focused on timepiece narratives and he 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 rejoiced living he he celebrated living he was a bit renowned in his earlier days for obsessively photographing his partners and his girlfriends non-stop like at capturing every moment, every part of the day. And this studio, this is where he grew up, this is, he was part of this, he was part of his helping his father. I think that studio environment, capturing the spirit and essence of people all through his life, watching his parents doing it and processing it, became ingrained within his head. And I think he'd become really obsessed with mortality and sort of losing time in a way. That'll work itself out as I, as I progress through this, but just going by his... Memories of Father, his other work on his dad, was a sort of, not all the way through that, but it was a documentation of parts of his life from his healthy, happy daily life, from when he was born, the historical aspects of the family right through to his father's death and after his death. It was a sort of celebration of his life, but it was a real look at the, at the nuts and bolts of his father and who he was. And, and this book plays parallel to that. This book... I think it's a homage to the studio. I think, obviously, when we start looking at the pictures and we look at the narrative in it, we see... Let's go to the, front, the first plate. We see a really important place in Masahisa's life, which was this studio. His family were important. Traditional costume and heritage was important. This is all heritage. And I think... And going back to why I think Memories of Father is important, because it shows the other side on the his life outside of the studio and how it worked and entwined in the studio. But this is very much laying bare a series of timepieces of his family, his siblings, his wife, their children, his parents, and it celebrates a moment, a period, a, a sort of stillness, a memorial of the sort of decay of the family, in a sense. And as the book progresses, you see a family who are flourishing and then you start to see the family decline and people dying and they're still... and their lives are still celebrated in this by pictures and by just being there and being part of it. 
in whatever form they were still recognised as this unit. That might sound quite complicated, but it's really interesting. I absolutely love this book. I love his work. I love his investigation into, into how we perceive time. I'll just rough, roughly run through the book. There's some nudity in this, but it's pretty innocent, and, it, and it's all in for art. It's nothing so crass, so I'm going to keep it in. And what, what, what we charge here, the, the first picture is of his father's studio, and the book ends with his father's studio, as, as it is in, I think, 1990. This is roughly about 1971. It's in his peak, and it, it, it's flourishing, and I think, I, I think around that time, Masahisa would be in Tokyo. And anyway, so that's how it, it sort of ends, plate 34. And then we've got the plate listings here. And then we've got this essay by, by Masahisa on, just on his, on his thoughts, on his, on his life and the meaning behind why he takes pictures. It's really insightful. And then this is the English version here. And then we've got this little essay called Archiving Death, the Family Portrait as a Sight of Mourning by Tomo Kusuga. And that's in Japanese as well. And what Tomo does is he just describes his legacy, really. He looks at his past. He looks at the way he, Masahisa, viewed photography, his journey, his trials and tribulations, I guess, and just the end towards the very end and his death, and sadly he had an accident, I think, about 92, just after The Ravens, this book initially came out, and The Memories of Father came out. He died about 2012, 20 years after an accident. I think he was incapable of working. I, I think it was a pretty bad head injury. There is other work which I've seen around 90s, which was in colour, and I'm not too familiar with that. It looks quite arty and abstract. That's his mum, I think. So this is a sort of history of the family portrait, I guess. He used to work in another format. When we look at this bouquet and we think maybe, you know, he's working in a, a sort of big Anthony-type plate camera or a, a, a large format camera, which his father did. I think he was using the Anthony glass plate camera. A lot of Masahisa's other work was shot on, on, a, on a smaller sort of 35mm or, or 120. I think when he was younger, he was giving a pearl collapsible camera with, and he says in this book he was using Sakura Pan F 16, ASA 16, and that was one of the first cameras he got on when he went to college and elementary school. He had to make a decision after school whether he would come back and work as a Shansin Shi, which is what they call a studio photographer, or a Shanshin Ka, which is an art photographer, and he chose a Shanshin Ka. Weirdly, he became both a Shanshin Sha and a Shanshin Shi. In this book, it's a Shanshin Shi as well as a Shanshin Ka. Memories of Father, it's like repertage. It's historical as well. It's got all this sort of stuff, but it's very repertage. It's some really, really good pictures of it. But hopefully, love Mac to publish it. Somebody needs to publish it and get it out there because it's, it's just wonderful. His work's amazing. And mem Memory of Father is just beautiful. I mean, it's, 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 it's heart-rendering. And I think this book, on what it's about, it's the homage to the studio. This was a big part of his life. The book Memories of Father was a homage to his father. Well, this is a homage to his family, and his father was part of that family, and his family as part of the studio. So I will work my way through it as best I can. So this is play two. This is his wife there, Yoko. That's his dad, his mum. I'll just bring this down a little bit. And we've got his sister, and he's... he's, he's just, kids and stuff like that. Now, this format really takes shape because there's some really interesting features with it which are hidden within the, the composition. The format of the composition roughly stays the same. Father there, mother there, wives and kids around here, and wife. Now, within the series of pictures which I'm going to show you, he throws in models, he throws in actresses, usually naked, and often in the place of his wife, or often to his right, which is quite interesting. And I'm not sure what the underlining thought process for that is. I think thought he was... It, there's some novelty shots where, like here, he turns his wife round and then he turns everybody round. So he's playing with the format. He's playing with maybe a part of them we don't normally see, which is obviously the back of things. He's really into tradition. This 
garment here on his wife, her stripped bare with that garment. I think that is a koshimaki, which is the traditional undergarment of the kimono. So we've got a traditional family style portrait. We've got the wife stripped naked, traditional, with the next thing she would have to have would be the kimono. And that's in another way, you would wear the kimono, you'd wear the traditional dress for your funeral portraits, for example, and they appear in the book. So it's interesting how it evolves. Now, what we'll see as we're progressing through it is his family getting old and changing and people dying and people replacing his wife. There's a little extract which I'm going to read, which was in this book, and excuse the pronunciation. The current of the flowing river does not cease, and yet the water is not the same water as it was before. The form that floats on stagnant pools, now vanishing, now forming, never stays the same for long. So, too, it is with people and dwellings of the world. Kamo no Chome, 1212. He was an essayist, a writer, a poet. Everything looks the same. We don't see age immediately. Time develops age. We see age in time. The water looks the same, but it's not the same. Everything's changing and evolving. Everything's moving through a process. That's what this is. That's what Masahisa is fascinated with, and that's what this shows in the dwellings of the studio, the shajo, which I can't pronounce that properly, it's S-H-A-J-O, I'm not brilliant at Japanese pronunciations. It's, it's such a concoction of a lot of different things, it's wonderful. Let's look through it, I'll try my best to remember where the plates are. So we, we're playing again, we've got the kids, the little kids jumping off there, and then we turned it around. His wife doesn't feature much really in this, even though he's done a book on her as well, he's got a uh, oh, it's a book. I don't know if he meant to do a book, but there is a book of the obsession of shooting his wife. But she, she doesn't really feature much in this at the beginning. And then everybody. So it's a sequence of changing the traditional style. I don't know what the back to the camera signifies, really. Now, plate six. We've got a dancer with the, with the, the koshimaki on who's taken on the same form as his wife. Now let's just jump back. Now this plate is in 72. I think the other one was 74. Let me just check that. So plate six, 72. Yeah, so this is 71. And then we'll jump back. So we're about a year down the line here. You can see people are getting older a year later. But his wife's been replaced by an actress, by a stand-in. It's really interesting. Whether he's just playing with symbolism, obviously he is with this. And it's really interesting that he's bringing this stranger into the family environment dressed the same as his wife. Again, we've got another stand-in. And I wonder what references that makes. It, it's, it's, it's really interesting. Is it he has an eye for the women? I don't know. Is it just a playful act to take and, and knock you off of the track a little bit? In, or is this a part of his mind being expressed on the camera? So each one of these has a different, as a sort of either a singer or a dancer or an actor. It's really interesting. Again, we're following the same format. And that just sort of continues here as we're going down. There's just still a change of format, but we've still, we've still got the same format. And let's... And then we come to play 10, which, is, which are his parents. Just drop that up a little bit. Modern underwear, I may add, not a traditional style underwear. I wonder if this is a, deferish, a, a sort of way of defining age. I was about, what, 20, 30 years between them, and they look, it's, I think he's not making his father look younger. As it's showing time again, make your decision, make your mind up. It's really, it's really interesting. And this is, again, 
with the Koshimaki. Sort of, that's sort of modern. But there's a definitely underlying sexuality to it. It's got to be. And I think that youthfulness and that traditional aspect's making the dad feel younger. It's look, making him look younger. And just playing around. Again, an actor, a singer, a dancer. And now we've got a new addition. So we go back to the original one. So we've got one, two, three children. Now we've got one, two, three, four children. We've still got the person in here. There. That's really interesting, isn't it? Now everybody's wearing the traditional koshimaki fundoshi for the men and for the women. And as I said before, and where we go to in this book is a period of recognition of dying and we're understanding that there is a time where we have to think about death. And this is a sort of preparation for death in a sense of the traditional outfit. Because if you go to the next picture of his father and his mother, this is their funeral photographs. Something beautiful in traditional costume for them to be remembered. And I wonder, this is the preparation before they take these pictures. This is how they will be remembered. What's interesting is that he has a picture of what looks like fish or something in, in a plate as a food offering, maybe. And then a rejump one, which looks like Masahisa's funeral photograph. So this is 74, 75. And now there's no woman, but we do have this little girl, Miyako. She will figure in this narrative as we're moving. And then we've got with his wife in the traditional costume. And this is another family shop. Salt Portrait, obviously. You can see the wire leading out there, which is shooting it. His wife's not featured again. But this little girl's growing. This was the sort of final shot in the sequence of the pre-80s set. This was a family together, a family having fun. Masahisa in his safe environment of this studio with his family, everybody's there thriving. And then I think he left and went back off to Tokyo. And then we come forward to 1985. This is like 10 years later. Look at the difference in quality. Now we've got animals. Father's old, mum's getting old. We've got a model again, a fully naked model now. And now Miyako died, but now we're bringing the photograph in and she was, we're keeping her in the family portrait. And it's interesting juxtaposition where you've got this, is this symbolizing life and that's death? It's, it's, it's fascinating. Now, what you have to remember, and this is why I kept going back to memories of father, it's because there's so much more going on behind this and what he's doing in documenting his dad's decline of health. He's obsessed with his father's time travel through life from birth to death. He's, he's obsessed with the travel of age within the family. Now the studio looks a little different because of technology, but the format is still the same. And where does it all lead? Where is it all going? Is it a personal remembrance and memorial for him or for who? Because when we get to the end of the book, his family are all split up, his father is dead, the studio is under new management, his mum's in a nursing home. There's almost like nobody left to really understand and see and reflect back off the timepiece. Just people like you and me now, who can try and make some sense of it all for what it is. Because it's beautifully complex. It's about somebody trying to capture life, death. It's not about amazing photography. It's about simple, traditional, 
It's about theatre. It's the theatre of life. And I presume these other elements are part of that theatre. It's not great photography, but it doesn't matter because it's about what the pictures are representing as a one long narrative. And that's what his work was about. It wasn't just one off pictures. It was a series of narratives, a time capsule. When you start looking at his work, that's what it's about. And that's why the Camel Chalmers poem really hits a nerve with me. His other work, his other photography is amazing. I mean, he really was a very good photographer and Japanese photography is so immense. It really is complex stuff sometimes. So, you know, this is celebrating the traditional portrait, the high street portrait. He's celebrating his father's life and what he's built and why they're there. He's celebrating and paying homage to this man and everything they've created around it. And then in his other ways, he's paying homage to his wife and his dad and a life. He's, he's registering life as a really important thing, which has some meaning, but we never see that. Life just passes us. And that's what I'm getting from this. That's why it's beautiful. And I think if you see these images on their own, you might not make sense of them, but you have to start seeing them as a beginning and end of something of a complete and bigger story. And when you get that, you start to investigate it. And that's what you can take into your own thought process and you're trying to make complex. This is life work. This is the, the things he does are not just stuff he shoots here and there. This is like completely obsessively repetitive investigation following traditional format and methods and storytelling. Now, there's a difference, as you can see, as the children are going up, but now his father's died. But they're all happy. Everybody should be sad, maybe. I don't know. Beautiful pictures. How dignified does he just fit straight into there? If you look at his book, Memories of Honor, you won't see that. You see something totally different. But the portrait studio was a celebration of and dignified. It made you feel important. And that's what I feel this is doing and with these style of portraits. Now, roughly, I think this is the last shot in the series of this. And you can see now the family have all dispersed. The father's dead. His mum goes into a nursing home. And there's nothing left. And this is, I think, 1990, roughly. It's the end of an era. And what's left is these memories. It's poignant. It's beautiful. It's really thought-provoking. And it's... What photography should be about. Give it meaning, give it narrative, give it structure, give it something, deliver a message. He went deep, he's gone really deep. This is deep, deep, deep photography. Mac Books, I hope you bring out Memories of Father because you need Memories of Father, in my view, to accompany this book. I hope whoever's listening to this can just take something to this. I hope I make some sense of it. You will all see things differently. I'm just giving you my view. But I think Masahisa was definitely a genius in long-term lifetime narratives, in age, in life, in death. Go and check his work. Check the Ravens out. Beautiful piece of work. Have a look at his work. Get this book. It's fantastic. And just have a little insight into the way Masahisa and his thought process. And then get out and get memories of father. Because it is unbelievable. Thank you. Please share the channel. Please subscribe. I hope you liked it. Rest in peace, Masahisa. Thank you very much.